Welcome. Here we are. Uh, this is the first of three series. We did a, uh, a Saturday session uh, that covered all, ran through all three of these topics, uh, these aspects of the question, what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, and there was just too much, of course, to cover. And we thought, well, let's go back and, and dive a little more deeply into each one of these. So we've set these up on three successive days and uh, we'll see what we can see what we can learn about it. Uh, what we can probably more questions than, than anything. Uh, so today is internet access. Uh, we are the Gibbet Libraries Network. Global collaboration of libraries doing interesting things with technologies. Uh, and today, what we're really talking about in terms of internet access is library Wi Fi in effect. I mean, there are another number of other uh, elements to that, but essentially, it's uh, connecting to the library through the library via Wi Fi since we can't get into the buildings and access the fixed stations. Uh, the question is, how does library offer internet access outside of the building and library Wi-Fi is it? Uh, how far that goes is an open question. Uh, it depends a lot on the, the connectivity tool, but the wireless that uh, we're talking about it, it is one of the flavors of the IEEE standard on Wi-Fi and the one that we're talking about is the 5 gigahertz and the 2.4 gigahertz standard. Uh, Wi-Fi access point frequencies. Uh, that inner circle there, the 60 gigahertz, this is down in the millimeter wave, these are very, very short range, very, very high speed, high frequency. Uh, it's kind of at the core of what everybody's been talking about for millimeter wave, uh, 5G uh, uh, systems. But, you know, what about the people that are farther away from these dense uh, cell areas, which you have to have for these, for that frequencies? Uh, other useful frequencies in, in the blue and red circles, that's not proportional. Those distances are more not measured in uh, tens of meters like uh, traditional Wi-Fi, but in hundreds and thousands of meters, uh, which can be used for data communications as uh, open uh, frequencies, open public spectrum like the TV, TV white space, which is one of those. What we're going to, one of the things we're going to look at today are uh, parking lot, hotspots, uh, how libraries are, I mean, just in the last week, uh, ALA has recommended and a number of state libraries and others have recommended that libraries open their Wi-Fi 24-7. And, uh, and we've recommended, and we'll talk about a little bit later, how to uh, boost those signals so they can carry a little further outside of the building. Uh, here's one from Holland, Michigan. Uh, where they identify the actual parking spaces that you have for the best signal. So I will uh, try to retake control of my stop, no, stop sharing. And there we are back now. So, um, I think I kind of skipped over our order of our speakers, but uh, we're going to uh, lead off with uh, Daniel, uh, Nathaniel Rasmussen from the uh, Schlo Center Regional Library in State College, Pennsylvania. Uh, Nathaniel's image of that of their closed library and open parking hotspot was really the thing that kind of triggered this, and so uh, we're just going to hear from him, kind of what's been happening with that particular implementation. And then we'll uh, move through our other speakers, uh, hopefully, and, and have a lot of time for, for questions. Uh, we will, uh, uh, Nathaniel, if you could uh, post that, that list of links that I sent to you. Did you get that by email? Uh, uh, these, are, these are links of, of uh, things that have been sent in or are useful. We're going to put them at the top of the chat. For everybody's kind of record and uh, so look at those have you have use of those 
and we'll start off with Nathaniel. So welcome back, Nathaniel. Thank you for being the spark that kind of got this all going. So what's right. new in State College? Well, hello, everyone. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Okay, good. Got a number of different microphones connected to my computer right now, so it's always fun. <clears throat> Yeah, well, uh, you know, if uh, my apologies to anyone that attended our little meeting on Saturday because I don't have a whole lot more to report. But um, yeah, we did we did kind of had one of our images go viral um, on the internet last week. So happy to share that again with you. Uh, are you seeing my slides? Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, you know, one of the first things that we realized during this crisis was that, you know, the folks without access to digital information will be at a disadvantage and perhaps even, you know, reduced health capacity. Um, so we, we talked pretty quickly about what we could do to address that, um, trying to keep people to respect the social distancing and realize that our parking lot was a real asset in this case. So we made this sign, um, adjusted the digital signage at the front of our lot, and um, we uh, we put that out there on social media and elsewhere, and it seemed to catch on. Um, we've been seeing some use. I think I saw 200 use users on our Wi-Fi last week when the, the building itself was closed the entire week. Uh, this week, it seems like use so far is down a little bit from that. I'm not exactly sure why. I'll double check again at the end of the week, but uh, we are still seeing people in in their cars in the lot um, when we run in to pick up something or something. You know, staff are no longer allowed in the building either, for the most part. But IT is exempted from that. So we are uh, continuing to provide that that access. At the same time, I'm um, trying to work with a couple of my partners in our television white space deployment to see if we can get those redeployed to similar locations for additional access. Um, it's all very difficult with everyone um, focusing on immediate needs at the time of the crisis, but I'm hopeful that we may have another location to turn up in the next week to three, I imagine, depending on how things go. How but have yeah, you um, publicized? And uh, we've put it out. Spot. Yeah, largely it's been a social media uh, a thing. Uh, we've had a lot of our partners in our community sort of amplify our, our messaging on this. Um, and uh, we've gotten word out to the um, some of the health and human service agencies in our community as well, who do information and referral especially, so they know that this is an option available to people that need access. Um, We'd love to expand it. Um, we've encouraged, we're a district center library in Pennsylvania. That means that, that we provide IT help and guidance to libraries in four counties in Pennsylvania. And uh, we've been uh, encouraging our libraries in our district to do the same thing we are. And they are all in various stages of, of doing that. So I also saw recently that ALA pushed out an article, um, you know, highlighting libraries that are doing this. So. It certainly uh, was very good news last week when the FCC made it very clear. We had already believed that this was perfectly legitimate use under our, our E-rate um, subsidy, but they reaffirmed that officially last week, which was good news for us as well. Very good. We'll uh, dive a little more deeply into that uh, remote uh, access uh, situation that you, that you mentioned uh, later on. So mm -hmm. that's good. Uh, it's a challenge, I think, to use social media to get the word out to people that don't have connections, that there's a connection. Uh, it is. But it's good to, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good point of challenge uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, uh, it's good you've got a sign, people drive by, so that's yeah. good. Yeah, uh, I mean, the if, point, I, yeah. we are also, we're also, we'll have an article in our newspaper um, coming out next week that will highlight this, um, as well as, like I said, the uh, social service agencies are aware of it. I've let our county government know about it as well, so. Excellent. Uh, we uh, will, uh, we'll return to that. Uh, next up, we had Stuart Hamilton. Uh, who has development for libraries of uh, Ireland, but is uh, on the road and not yet at his destination. 
<clears throat> Stuart will be with us tomorrow when we get into digital services and then again on uh, on Saturday when we talk about uh, physical materials, which is, well, these are all really challenging subjects, but uh, he sends his regrets. So uh, Lisa, that means you're up. Lisa's with the Maine State Library and they've been doing some interesting things there. So Lisa, take the share if you have anything image wise to put up and, and tell us what's going on. Sure thing. Um, I do want to point out that um, we have somebody that's asking if where the information will be made available, the links for the next two um, next two meetings. If you wanted to hit on that real quick while I get my all right, uh, good. I mean, I'm not looking at the uh, at the chats. Um, we will uh, uh, we'll send out a new a new link uh, that after this is over, we're of course. Uh, going to store this uh, recording and make that available, but we will send out a new a new link. We're going to use the same link, but we're going to send out a new announcement uh, later today. But it'll be same time tomorrow, same Zoom. Awesome. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. But very good. So this first slide is really more for my purpose. There will be. Um, just to. Remind me what these slides. It's are. not done, but it's an hour. It's an hour and a half long. Go sit. Go uh, sit. If, let me yeah, interrupt sit. Lisa uh, to ask everyone to go on mute if you can, please. Everyone, we've got some background going on. All right, Lisa, if, go ahead. If, if you don't, I'll do it for you. <laughs> All right, Lisa. I think you've muted Lisa. Thanks. <laughs> I was trying to, I'm like, unmute me. <laughs> All right. So um, here's a quick capture of the main landscape. And what you're seeing are main public libraries and where we're located across the state. And more to the point, um, down the bottom of that uh, screen capture is the wired fixed wireless technologies, um, FCC uh, speed tier seven, which is everybody that has 100 or more um, megabits per second coming to the door fiber. Um, so we have, depending on who files their annual report, um, about 260 public libraries in Maine. And Maine is one of those states where the libraries are all um, locally funded, locally operated. So we're just over half that are 501c3 um, private nonprofits. The other half are municipal departments and they're all locally funded. So um, getting everybody on board with something is kind of like herding cats but these libraries do all share MSLN, which is the main school library network, and that's our E-rate funded um, fiber that goes to the door of all of these libraries. So for a very rural state in the patches where you're seeing big gaps are probably like, you know, the Allagash Wilderness and North Main Woods and all that sort of a thing, and even in a few places there, we do have some libraries that have that. You can see that we've got quite a few sites that have um, that that fiber coming to the door. Uh, a lot of those libraries have started showing up their Wi-Fi capacity. Um, up in Northern Maine, for example, we've used Category 2 E-rate funding um, to shore up the equipment inside so that we maximize that fiber coming to the door. And uh, we've had some cluster uh, grant initiatives through organizations like uh, Northern Forest Center that have done um, Western Maine, kind of West and Southern Oxford County um, libraries and groups to maximize what they're getting coming to the door. Um, I was trying to find a parking lot shot um, because I take pictures of the libraries as I travel around the state, but you know, in my diligence to respect patron confidentiality, I realized I didn't take a lot of shots of people's cars and parking lots. So I did find a shot of the Naples, Maine Public Library, which is kind of in South Central um, Maine. It's a tourism heavy community. So the population's not that big um, during the cold weather months, but as the summer comes on, it just blows up. So this is from inside the library. All those people that are parked there aren't necessarily attending the church next door. Um, this is not a Sunday. So those are all people that are there using the parking lot um, Wi-Fi 
from the library. And this is a common theme that you'll see all around the state. In fact, probably one of our biggest problems our public space, especially in more tourism dependent regions, is adequate parking because you can drive by. There's times when I've gone to do site visits and I've had to park way down the street because the parking lot is just full. Um, and you know, sometimes it's out of state plates for people that just need to access the internet. The picture on the right, uh, Don, you'll recognize, I'm sure, in particular, this is one of the uh, white space antenna uh, that was grant funded to Millinocket Memorial Library. They actually had a second line through Network Main run to the library um, to connect to that. So that throws out through downtown Millinocket. There is a story that one of the um, supporters of the library likes to tell in that they do a lot of architectural design work that are really big, heavy files that need to be uploaded. And what they used to have to do was put them on a bus on a hard drive and ship them up to Presque Isle where somebody up there could grab it and upload it. Um, they don't have to do that anymore. So that has made a huge difference there. Um, Millinock is going through a huge capital uh, campaign right now. So they have actually moved their antenna and their connection to their um, temporary site so that they can keep that access going. So this is the big news that came out of Maine this week. And much like Nathaniel, I assumed that everybody was doing 24 seven from their publics and throwing the signals out because that's how we've done it in Maine. Um, I was, I was uh, surprised to learn that that wasn't accepted everywhere. And the people that do handle our E-rate at Network Maine were very careful to check with their E-rate um, consultant to say, are we good on this? Because they interpreted the verbiage from the FCC as saying as long as it was covering the campus or the property. So we naturally included parking lot and anywhere it bled to where people needed to park to access library internet. Um, the restricted to the building was news to me. So we've been kind of doing this right along. The FCC, as Nathanus had kind of caught up to that thinking, so yay. We appreciate that. Um, so what this is, is a screen capture of what the uh, live map that looks like from Network Main, where they started their study from CAR initiative this week. And what this does is opens up the um, K-12 schools and the college campuses around the state to also be throwing their Wi-Fi out as far as they can 24-7. Same as what the publics have been doing all along. And um, the map looks a little sparse here, mostly because they have not loaded all the public libraries over. So really what you need to do is add this, realize that it's populating more every day to the first map that I showed you, which showed all those libraries scattered all over the state. And that tells you how many access points there really are around the state for high-speed internet. Um, the link for the live map, if you wanna follow how that's going, is on the bottom there, and I will put the live link in the chat as well. Great, Lisa. Um, thank you. That's that's fantastic. You have a closing statement right now, or you want to wait till we come back and have some questions? Um, you know, I'm trying to think of something profound. Other than, well, don't you know, don't we, don't strain yourself <laughs> now. Uh, we cannot lose ground on this. We, you know, it's uh, it's too important. I don't I don't think there's going to be any any going back. I think this I, is gonna I, be I totally agree, and and I don't think this is going to be over soon. No, uh, not not very soon. I, I it's not need a to one circle, and done. No, I do need to circle back uh, and uh, recognize and thank our co-hosts uh, and introduce uh, Stephen Weiber with uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Libraries Association, who's hosting this uh, Zoom call, and uh, uh, as well as the Internet Society and uh, the Partnership for Public Access. Uh, we're also getting uh, media uh, co-hosts from Broadband Breakfast, who's put the word on, uh, out on this and has, has been a longtime advocate for, for libraries and connectivity and how libraries anchor uh, community networks. Uh, Stephen, uh, say, say something about IFLA and, and the partnership and how you think we were trying to have Stuart in here from Ireland to make the point, not just what's going on in his libraries, but that this is a, this is a global effort. Uh, it's a global circumstance. It's a global uh, uh, plague. And uh, so 
how are, how are we going to how are we going to really reach out worldwide with with these issues and and help people so thank you don i'm going to do this by uh, <laughs> audio only um thank you for the introduction i think obviously in part it, it, it's meetings like this it's sharing ideas i think already we're seeing in the chat simply people sharing ideas and people hadn't thought of this they hadn't realized that that was possible and just the fact of having come across this sort of inspiration makes it a possibility i know that in a lot of countries libraries are much more dependent on on local government even national government to do things if it's possible for them to be able to cite these examples to talk about well it was possible there why isn't it possible here that can also be really powerful so i know that i for one will be noting down some of the really good ideas we are updating our own resource pages which include exactly our ideas on what you can do what is possible and i look forward to continuing to do it so keep on talking keep on sharing keep on having these ideas and we'll be happy to make use of them and try and help get them taken up elsewhere in the world that's great Stephen. thank you very much again uh and it's you know it's not just not just the tens of millions of people in the u.s that lack uh, access it's the hundreds of millions of people and actually billions of people around the world that are not yet connected uh to the internet and uh, it's just a great wonder how how they're managing to get information and do communication without the internet right now. Uh, so uh, next up, we are privileged to hear from uh, uh, Brian uh, with the uh, with Scenic Brian Court. Uh, Scenic is the California Research and Education Network. Brian is an engineer there, and he has offered to uh, speak to us from his lunar base uh, uh, down here. I mean, I'm sure he's a pretty uh, sterile environment up there, but uh, we're down here kind of isolated, uh, but are looking for help on how to uh, boost these signals. You know, what can we do today? That's open the Wi-Fi at the building. We'll talk about what we can do beyond that, but we'll, we'll try to maximize what we're doing today. And I did post uh, a list of resources that uh, Scenic had forward to me, uh, or rather Nathaniel posted it earlier. So please look at those. It's, it's a rich uh, mix of, of resources. But Brian, what, uh, what, what can you tell us about just trying to make the most of our assets today? Uh, unmute, Brian. Unmute. Stephen, Brian. There we go. That work? Yep. Okay. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Cord. I'm the director of network design for Scenic. Scenic is the network services provider for higher ed and libraries in California. There are about 1,100 libraries in California in 181 jurisdictions, which means they do things at least 181 different ways. Uh, some of them have uh, seen from the beginning as part of their mission to do public Wi-Fi, including uh, the, the broad view that Maine embraced of uh, reaching the entire property. Others have, have not, and others haven't really thought about it at all, and we're trying to encourage them to do that now. Uh, as mentioned, the ALA is now recommending uh, Wi-Fi be left on 24-7 during closure, and the FCC has made that clarification that that does not jeopardize E-rate funds. They specifically uh, call out on library property rather than the community at large. And that is some, a conversation we've had to have with some of our libraries who would like it to be part of their mission to serve the entire community. But uh, our current belief is that we jeopardize E-rate funding. Most of the libraries we've talked to, and, and this is anecdotal and based on some quick surveys that we've done in the last few days, most of the libraries we've talked to have reported that accidentally or otherwise, their signal already reaches the parking lot. Uh, it's easy enough to check by walk, walking the laptop around the parking lot. For those who don't, um, they're looking at a few different options. If, if they can get power and copper or fiber outside easily, the best results can be had by putting an outside access point on the wall. But we're being told that there's a reasonable chance of success if you simply move one of your indoor access points to a window that has line of sight to the parking lot. And that is probably going to be enough to cover this in most typical sized uh, library parking lots. One point I wanted to make is if you need help, 
uh, your local college or university probably has been doing outdoor Wi-Fi for a long time. They probably have resources to share. They may have APs to lend or they may not, but they certainly have expertise. And if you have those relationships, I'd encourage you to draw on them. So what are the issues and what, is, what has gone well and what has gone wrong? Uh, quite a few libraries in California offer their Wi-Fi when branches are open, which does not seem like a distinction that makes a lot of sense these days. Uh, most libraries offer their Wi-Fi to the public at large, but some restrict to cardholders, which may uh, lessen the value of this to the most impacted at this time. So uh, they may want to think about rethinking that. Will your municipality go in and, and uh, you know, try to exert authority over people sitting in the parking lot, either in their cars or uh, just sitting there with social distancing? Uh, is this an essential activity as your police interpret it? Uh, that might be worth a call to your local law enforcement to work that out in advance. And there is at least one California library that when the uh, lockdown order came down, they explicitly decided not to support Wi-Fi in the parking lot because they felt that it would encourage congregation that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, I think that's the wrong decision, but it's the one they made. And then finally, uh, one library told us that they had Wi-Fi in the parking lot, but they turned it off because Scenic complained. And yes, when, when we get copyright infringement uh, complaints or other uh, reports of network abuse, we report that to our customers for them to take enforcement action if they can, which often they can't. But we would do that exactly the same way if somebody abused the Wi-Fi inside your building. And probably your response to that would not be to turn the Wi-Fi off. So uh, we are encouraging people to think about it as handling it as you would during normal circumstances. This really is not a different thing. That's really what I had to say. I'm happy to take questions or you can email me at bacbakeryaplecharlie at scenic.org. Uh, repeat that again, Brian, your, your email. bacbakeryaplecharlie at scenic.org. Very good. Uh, uh, you make a great point that the simplest, easiest thing to do is to locate a, uh, an access point antenna in a window. Uh, that that uh, uh, mounting it outside is, is a different level of challenge, but a reasonable one for different circumstances. That's the other point that really came through is the, the variation of circumstances. And people are all trying to, you know, cope with what's going on and they're having to make decisions on the fly. Uh, I think a lot of these decisions are, are gonna be tested and revised as we go along I mean, at, at the individual level, at the macro level. So uh, I think we all wanna give each other a lot of latitude to try and maybe not succeed the first time and keep at it. Till we, uh, till better solutions uh, emerged. Uh, your your point about the uh, E-rate is is a good one. It's a pervasive one that's going on. We're we're very much involved in the policy side of this, but for the moment, we're trying to encourage projects that can fall within the most liberal interpretations of the uh, various. Uh, mostly USAC definitions. And they've made additional clarifications, the FCC, about the use of uh, these signals after hours. Schools can make their, their, their access open when the school is closed, which of course is like all the time now. So uh, I imagine we're seeing a lot of that. <clears throat> I don't know if we have, <coughs> excuse me, Fred Brakeman on. Fred uh, is an advocate working in Colorado that, uh, to deploy school buses as uh, hot spots in neighborhoods, which is a, uh, a brilliant idea and a great use of, a, of a, another asset just sitting around. Uh, and so that's, is a, a school bus a library property? I mean, a school property? Well, yes, it is. It's been a debate, though, as to whether or not it's allowed. So that's going on. I think the point is we want to do things we think are okay and press on the FCC to affirm those actions as being within the scope of at least the intent. And I think returning to the intent of these rules is more important right now than the, than the absolute letter of those rules because the letter was written for a, a different circumstance that we're all facing today. Uh, 
So I don't, I don't hear from Fred, so I guess he's not here to tell us about that. Um, any, any questions for uh, Brian or Lisa or uh, Nathaniel? Uh, and I will go back to a, uh, the slideshow uh, that I had going and talk a little bit about what uh, was touched on by Lisa and Nathaniel and implied uh, by Brian on how to uh, deploy uh, these library access uh, points further away. Anyone? I put some, some things in the chat, um, but I was just going to mention that, um, you know, people are talking about repeaters and, and that sort of thing that the, uh, there are some pretty good mesh deployment tools for mesh, what they call mesh Wi-Fi, which means you don't need sort of a wired backhaul to your device. It is true that when you use those deployments, it, it will uh, reduce your bandwidth some, but I, I've had pretty good success with those uh, in covering a pretty wide area. Um, so, yeah, we, we typically use Ubiquiti gear. I'm sure that there are numerous other hardware providers that provide a similar uh, piece of equipment and you know reliability, but uh, it's definitely not something to be afraid of. We actually just put one of our exterior Wi-Fi access points in a window ourselves. Um, and the only reason we did that was our building has no exterior network cabling at the moment. Um, we would like to correct that uh, when we have the time and resources to do so. But uh, for the time being, the window option worked quite well for us. Great. Good, good, good thinking. Quick action. Uh, a, a lot of places, you know, the, the libraries are closed, but there are different sort of uh, rules on access and what's deemed and who is deemed, uh, you know, essential. It seems IT kind of gets that uh, that uh, role and and uh, responsibility. Uh, our our point is that right now access to public information is an essential service, and if you don't have that at home, it's absolutely reasonable that you be able to drive somewhere and access that in a safe environment, and you know cars aggregating is not actually uh, a health hazard. People get out, that's a different thing, but you know, it's, it's what we can do with what we've got within the, the, the strictures that we're all operating under. Uh, I wanna to touch on this, the, white, the library's white space project as it pertains to ways to extend library Wi-Fi further away from the library building. You know, some 80 million people depend on libraries for internet access, either wholly or partially. And, uh, uh, but they have to go to one of those, you know, 16,000 facilities to, to access that. Uh, this is what started several years ago with the idea of how could we make that, that what we would say now is an essential service, uh, more convenient, more available in more places. So we've been using this open spectrum uh, frequencies in the TV band that was liberated from the digital TV conversion as, uh, as backhaul to remote, uh, remote routers. Uh, it's like Wi-Fi, so you don't have to pay anybody. You don't have to ask anybody to use it. The FCC has already set up the rules. It basically, uh, the, 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 these TV frequencies have, are tolerant to, uh, not only distances, but obstructions. Uh, they can pass around buildings over hills. And that's the basic setup. You've got a base station, as Lisa showed at the library, and then you have a remote, remote unit somewhere, uh, a remote TV white space uh, radio equipment that then is connected to a Wi-Fi, a set of Wi-Fi router to create a regular hotspot. The general setup looks something like this. It's a handful of remote uh, stations, and these have been deployed in different kinds of places around the community. You can see there's a, an antenna at, the, at that blue top is pointed back at the base station, a directional antenna to uh, optimize signal strength. And, uh, and then uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi hotspot is plugged into that to create a regular size hotspot. So the, uh, the question then becomes, uh, at least as Brian has mentioned that, you know, eligibility, wow. we, uh, we are advocating that these be 
uh, declared as library outlets, as kiosks. Library bookmobiles and kiosks are eligible under, under E-rate, and uh, it's up to the state libraries to designate what is a branch, what is a library, what is an outlet or an annex, uh, and then uh, those then become eligible uh, to connect and to uh, either under, under category one under E-rate uh, or category two for the, for the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi component of that. There's no cost of using the in, in-house signal to share it over distance. There's no additional cost because it's already, it's already the connection. Uh, worst case is you would allocate out a fraction of the cost uh, of the library broadband to support a wireless extension. So if you had a, if you had a fast connection, then uh, it would only be you know, a few percent of that, uh, which is, is incidental. Uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting some more uh, feedback, uh, microphone mute from somebody, please. Uh, this is one case, it's another project uh, in Georgia, Milledgeville. It was the capital of Georgia in the Civil War, but they're now uh, doing other things today. So they're, uh, they're building these, uh, these kiosks re by repurposing uh, old payphones around town. Uh, and here they've even done up the schematic of, of these uh, stations and they are hard at work uh, building them. So uh, here's a, another project in here on uh, South Dakota where they have one of these systems set up and, and they're, they're closed doing curbside and, and uh, have repurposed all their checkout hotspots to the EMA people so that they can have another communications vehicle uh, as, as they move around. Uh, that's another topic uh, that uh, is on everybody's mind is, you know, these, these MiFi units, these checkout hotspots, uh, the, the obvious sort of answer for everybody being connected is give everybody, you know, one of these, but that, that's complicated. That takes time. There's a lot of manufacturing issues and pricing issues, you know, if you're familiar with checkout hotspots, people love them, and it must be difficult for people to give them back after their two-week period or whatever the, the timing is, but uh, that will probably move ahead. In the meantime, there are things we can do with, with low-cost equipment that might be an interim solution such as this. So one of their units, they're, they're transferring over to uh, a, a temporary testing site, a virus testing site. So this is... Uh, this this backup uh, use for these in times of uh, disaster is part of the project. Uh, we're calling these uh, libraries as second responders, creating these wide area networks that are resilient, that they should be self-powered, have portability so they can be redeployed like, like in this uh, image here uh, in response to whatever flavor of disaster you have. Of all the ones that we imagined, a global pandemic was not one of them. We were looking at fires and earthquakes and floods and hurricanes, but not this. Nevertheless, uh, it is a time to look at how this kind of capability can be used, and it is. So um, that is what we're doing with, uh, with TV white space, but we're also expanding beyond uh, other, uh, into other frequencies you know, five gigahertz, that things that require line of sight, but are, are less, less expensive uh, to, to use. Um, is, uh, is Ryan on? Ryan, are you on? I am. Aha. So, Ryan, do you, are, you, are you set to uh, share what you're doing over there in Nebraska? I, I am. Let me uh, okay. pull up. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, good. But just keep that uh, thought in mind that this is uh, library Wi-Fi and how to use it, how to boost it, how to share it, how to spread it, uh, or really anybody else's version of, of public Wi-Fi. Uh, the McDonald's are closing. The you know, Starbucks are closing. Uh, millions of kids are stuck without 
you know, any way to join in this shift over to, uh, uh, you know, online learning, which is, you know, we're not ready for uh, the, the, um, the, the, the difficulties of, of doing that because it's so, it's so complicated. Uh, but, you know, we're going to have to do something on the fly. So uh, Ryan is with us from uh, uh, ESU5, which is a region of Network Nebraska. They're also doing one of these projects. And so he's going to talk about that a little bit. And then uh, we will be, uh, we'll have some time for open discussion. So uh, Ryan, thanks. And I'll go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I'm Ryan McDowell. I work with uh, ES25. We're a service unit um, in Nebraska, Southeast Nebraska. We have 10 school districts that we provide services for. Um, we had done a project in the past with um, homework hotspots in one of our communities. Um, so in Beatrice, we actually use TV white space to provide um, homework hotspots or, or internet access through the public library. Um, in cooperation with the, with the school and our office. Um, so we, we brought up internet at a couple different public uh, parks, as well as our community players um, theater, which uh, houses an after school program. And uh, we've had pretty good success with that. Um, an issue that we've ran into during this, this pandemic is they actually closed all the parks. So the public Wi-Fi that was available um, there is is no longer usable um, so that that posed a, another issue for e-learning and and students trying to complete their um, homework with uh, with all the schools closed so um, Brian so excuse me it means the, the 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 parks are closed but it means you can't drive into a so park, parking lot or so what I read was, from, yep Go ahead. Yeah, they're they're closed, but yeah, I think you you at your own risk you can you can still go there, but I think that's still deterring people away. Um, but yeah, you can you can still drive in and park. I think their their main concern is the playground equipment and um, shared shared utilities and stuff. So uh, you could still pull up into into the parking lots and and get access, um, but it's it's definitely not being used as as much as we would have thought it would would have been um well, well i think people happily are discouraged from certain behaviors uh on the other hand the the uh you know the the orders or the recommendations uh can you know they're 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 broad strokes on on what people can do we have to shape ourselves around our circumstances in a more fine-tuned way uh, to allow for all these variations and needs, but go ahead. What, what have you got now? Yeah. So, um, another project we started looking into actually before all of this, um, came about was a, a project between, um, one of our, our rural public schools, um, Tri-County Public Schools is, is out here, um, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but they have gig connectivity um and a neighboring uh town which is uh the town of plymouth which i think it's it's just over 400 people but i mean there's there's quite a few students there um and it's just over four uh 6.7 kilometers so just over four miles away from the school and it does have land site so um what we're trying to get accomplished and as soon as possible is is to bring up a point to point, um, and I think Nathaniel had mentioned that he was ubiquity, and that uh, we do as well. And we've had great, great, um, uh, great, great experience with ubiquity. Um, and our our plan is to use air fiber. So I mean, it's it's, I guess, marketed as actual gigabit wireless. Um, so with this connection, and I I pulled up a the air link here. It'll do a an estimate. So it's saying that we could. Uh, possibly get 486 megabits per second um, connect connectivity to the town of Plymouth, um, where we will actually provide uh, a new connection to the public library there. And then um, that 
that signal will be distributed across town to different um, different uh, areas. So their community center, um, I think they have a, <clears throat> a coffee shop, um, a fitness center, uh, there's a splash pad, there's, there's, a, there's multiple areas in town that we could essentially cover the whole town with Wi-Fi if, if we brought up enough hotspots. But what kind of connection does the library have now? They have, so they have a, a rural provider, which um, I think they allow them to be on the, the city uh, water tower and they get six, I think it's six meg, six meg uh, wireless signal. And then they actually open that up uh, wide open to the public out the window. Um, so, I mean, they're sharing a six meg connection. And I mean, they mentioned to me that it goes down for three days at a time. So I can only oh imagine boy. what I'm doing right now. Well, this is, this is great. Uh, this is not the first project that you partnered with uh, school and library. Uh, and I think it's a really uh, common circumstance <coughs> where the schools across the country have become really well wired over the last five years or so. Uh, uh, it, it's been astounding. And, and yet the libraries, especially small town libraries are, just like what uh, 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 Ryan just described in, in Plymouth, you know, these are these are departments of small town governments, and they get a piece of the government, you know, broadband, and that's what they get to to uh, uh, to provide access with. Whereas the schools have the cap capability, as as Ryan is demonstrating, to share some of that enormous capacity with their uh, fellow educational institutions. This is another. Now, whatever Plymouth may be doing with it as far as sparing it around the community, how they do that is a, is a different question. But the ability of the school to connect uh, and provide connectivity to, to a public library is, is totally allowable under E-Rate. They're both clearly eligible facilities to do that. So we think this is a big opportunity around the country for these small town libraries to partner with schools. It's a, it's a partnership that's rare to find as a matter of fact uh, ryan's project uh, he's a little shy to uh, to say won a uh, nsf mozilla challenge grand prize last year for for this uh, this partnership and this project that he's just describing anything else for us uh, ryan um so i'll just explain quickly how how we're planning to set this up um we want to mimic the ssid that that is broadcast at the school. So um, since the school is one-to-one -one with Chromebooks, once they go home, um, if they are in, in range of a hotspot, the, the SSID will be the same one that their Chromebook connects to at school. So it'll automatically connect. They won't have to do anything. And then um, our plan is to, to work with the library to see how they want this to be broadcast, but we'll, we'll set up a separate um, network for the library so they can, they can monitor and track usage and, um, uh, just see see how many patrons are actually gaining access in in town. So, so you're going to divide that uh, that signal over to uh, uh, Plymouth. One ask one part of it, portion of it for students to log on directly to the school server, and then another portion for the library to make available to the patrons under whatever circumstances they normally do. Yes. Yeah. So it'll, it'll be one, yeah. One, one network will be just like the school's network for students. It'll be um, password protected and we'll probably lock it down by Mac address. So only their devices can connect. Um, and then there'll be a separate library connection. And this, yeah. this, this, um, I guess the tower that we're using is, is pretty much a grain bin, a, a private grain bin in town, which I mean, it's probably a hundred feet tall. So <clears throat> we will, we'll have a, uh, a couple sectors on there and then we'll have uh, point to point radios back back to that sector throughout town for, for those homework cost spots so great um and and i think it's an important point that these are managed more or less the way they're managed every day that a, that a hot spot in the building whether it's the school or the library uh can be treated uh the the same way the logons uh, can be dealt with just as they are, uh, you know, if you're in the building. So that's 
that simplifies things. You don't want the fewer variables, the better. Uh, right. I'm just putting up on, this is on the kiosk point. Thanks very much, Ryan. Yeah, uh, no problem. Thank you. This is a, uh, this is a definition of a kiosk that the library of Michigan has published. It, it basically says that a, a kiosk has uh, Wi-Fi. It's in a public space and that uh, it has some embedded kind of interface. It doesn't require a user to bring their own device. Uh, that's it. It doesn't, it's not required to handle physical materials. A lot of kiosks do that very expensive uh, uh, equipment to receive and distribute books. That's great. But uh, and in our scenario, uh, the, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, digital is, is uh, virus free as long as you can use your device uh, or another device to get it. How you would handle an embedded, like a tablet on a kiosk, I don't know. That's, a, that's an interesting question that maybe doesn't make sense today. Maybe voice activated. I don't know. But the Wi Fi part, uh, the public space part is uh, uh, should be enough. I'm, we're hoping that more state libraries will adopt uh, uh, definitions that are, uh, allow libraries to do that. I think they may be waiting on their libraries to ask them to do that. Uh, the National Association of State Libraries is looking for the state libraries to uh, uh, encourage them to call what would be great would be a, a national standard for this which shouldn't take that long to come up with, but uh, that, that allows me to uh, make a blanket statement for a lot of individual circumstances that I'm sure are much more complex, but we encourage them to try that because we think it'd be very helpful. So uh, we've got a number of people on this call. It's kind of hard to have just a, a free flowing discussion, but if anybody is just feeling an urge to, uh, to hold forth, uh, please do. It's it's uh, open the mics if you will if they're not already, uh, Stephen and uh, anybody want to have anything they want to add or say. We just got a few minutes. Don't be shy. What a shy group. Well, I hope everybody is uh, doing okay, is feeling good, staying safe. Uh, it's a big challenge. Tomorrow we're going to get into uh, another set of really complicated issues around uh, digital services. Uh, in a way, what we've talked about today doesn't really mean anything. Uh, and, unless you're talking about the things that you can do with internet access. And in terms of the world of libraries, that involves a whole range of, uh, of services and e-materials and content uh, uh, and, and communications that, uh, that so many people depend upon. Uh, we're, uh, we're aware that, that uh, demand for those materials is, uh, increasing rapidly and we'll hear some stories on how libraries are accommodating those demands uh, expanding their licenses to uh, ebooks uh, the the uh, uh, recorded books uh, nathaniel will talk tomorrow about uh, the the Zoom license that the library, his library has just acquired to make that available for people so they can do kind of what we're doing today. This is more or less how meetings are going to happen for a while. Uh, it's our sense that you know we're going to be pretty much like we are today for a couple of months. It might start to loosen up if there's some way figured out to do that and do enough testing so we, we know where we are and allow us to uh, move around a little more freely, but uh, it's difficult to know what exactly uh, this lockdown is going to look like in in two weeks or four or eight or longer. It's just really wide open. Um, 
so how libraries are serving uh, and, and expanding their various digital services is going to be our topic tomorrow. And then the day after that, we're going to try to deal with physical materials. Now, uh, I've, maybe all of you have been searching on these topics. You'll get a lot of re returns if you search on any of these three topics in this series. And the physical materials aspect, of course, is, is one of the more challenging, but a, a lot of libraries, I've seen a number of libraries anyway, they're still doing uh, curbside service. You can, you know, you need, you need access or a telephone to call and, and have a book reserved and uh, set aside for you to pick up. And then you call them when you're outside and they'll deliver it to you. And then, okay, well, what about the return side of that? How long and what process do libraries have, if they're even allowed to do it, uh, to uh, take materials back, uh, what, quarantine them for 48, 72 hours or longer? Does it depend on the material? Is it a, you know, is it a, a plastic case on a CD or is it a, a paper book? Uh, all these kinds of issues are, are being uh, thought about and wrestled with right now uh, in a context where library staff are generally restricted uh, from going to the library. I say generally, it's, it varies by state, of course, and even by, by uh, county and municipality. So once again, we're all trying to feel our way along here. It's really amazing what, where we find ourselves today. Uh, everybody is at home and, uh, and we're just, uh, we just have to cope with it. And I would say further, what I hope this represents today and what you're all hopefully doing out there is, is asserting yourselves against this rather than just being defensive about it. Look for the, for the weaknesses in there, or the holes in what this, uh, this pandemic is creating where we can do new things in original ways. And, and even as the country seems to really be lagging in uh, getting on top of this with its uh, lack of testing, we are pretty good at inventing things. And I think this would be a real benefit to a large part of the world if we can come up with solutions and share them. So we're looking to hear more from outside of the country and more from around the country and more from you. We'll be posting the recordings. Uh, we'll record the chat, post that as well. And we'll be in touch. We have everybody, thank you for registering. We'll be in touch with everybody so that we can uh, uh, follow up with uh, links and announcements uh, as you may be interested. So I appreciate everybody's time and especially our our guest uh, presenters today. I apologize for the the snafu on the uh, on the mechanics of the of the Zoom today, but uh, uh, Nathaniel and and Lisa and Brian and Ryan, thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, there's a lot more behind what you've been able to tell us in a few minutes, but we'll look forward to hearing more. So thank everybody for uh, all of this, and uh, we will hopefully see you next time. That's it for now.